Welcome to Fort Knox. Once again, I am John Fort, this time with Tony Fidel. Um, I mean, it, it seems like not quite enough to introduce you first as Nest founder, also author of Build, and there's a longer title than that. Uh, but you know, I first got to know you when you were at Apple, um, the iPod, and et cetera. Um, but now I, I want to talk about the book, of course, but really the book is about building things, which you have done quite a bit of. So I always start these conversations, welcome first of all, with the question of today's toughest problem, but within the context of, uh, of the book, I wanna ask you, what do you think is today's toughest problem for builders, for inventors that, that incentivized you to write this book so that you wouldn't have to keep answering questions one off <laughs> all the time? So first, John, as always, it's great to be here. It's always great to talk to you, spend time together. Um, the biggest problem that I see, um, and this is in the businesses I think that matter, whether it's climate, you know, or, or society or health, the biggest things I see are most of the people working on this stuff are researchers, engineers, scientists. They're amazing people and they're doing brilliant things. The storytelling component and the things that they're creating, the disruptive technologies that are going to help this planet, help our societies, they don't necessarily know how to communicate the scope and scale and, and, and the media the medium by which their, their innovations will impact this planet. So they start with little things like, oh, I'll just tell a couple of people. It's like, no, these things are so important that we come in and help them build this huge strategy, marketing and communication strategy with detailed uh, storytelling so that we can get people engaged because we have to go all the way. We can't just talk to a few people. This is These problems are global and, and the solutions are also have to go global. So the story has to be uh, you know, crafted and the marketing has to be built for a global audience. So that's weird though, to hear you talk about the biggest problem for innovators being marketing, right? Yeah, be yeah. Because... Because traditionally, the researcher people, the product people, sort of you know, outside of places like Apple, of course, think, you know, marketing, oh, well, that's just exactly. icing on the cake. That's just the color that you scribble on the outside of the thing. I know Apple's philosophy is different. And in your book, you talk about the difference between a great idea, great team that connects well to a problem and and one that doesn't. So how does marketing and storytelling fit into that? Well, marketing is the output of great product marketing or product management. And what that's all about is under the one, the voice of the customer. And the second thing is understanding the why, understanding the pain points those customers have, understanding why we're building something and how it's going to solve those pain points or how it's going to be a superpower for them after they get the product. So you have to be able to tell the why story. Most of technologists and engineers, I did this too, General Magic was this, we talked about the what. We didn't talk about the why. And so if you look at all of Apple's marketing, this is what I really learned from Steve, but I, you know, I, you know, I really saw it come to full light, but learned at General Magic that we had no why. But we started to figure it out as I went on in my career and then saw a genius to it, Steve, right, of why. That is the biggest thing. Because that, that will separate the companies that are just putting stuff together and they're seeing if it sticks. Sony used to do this all the time. Various consumer electronics, they just put stuff together and see if it sticks. They don't really think about the problems. They don't really think about how to solve those and constrain themselves to a story that really resonates with the audience. And then when they get done with the product, does the product actually meet the expectations they set with the story? So and here's got all together, and you got to do that story at the beginning of the product, not at the end of the product. But that's so that's yes, that. yes, yes. That's what people are used to seeing. We're used to seeing advertising, which is that message after the product's already done. I'm most interested in the incremental whys, the why that that's even before the the product is fully formed or or even partially formed. The the why that says you know the the world needs whatever it is, and then right, what form right. should that take? And then the incremental whys that either allow that project to continue or kill it off. What can you tell me about 
the, the ways that that gets brought to bear. Because this reminds me of this concept of technology transfer, where you had Xerox Park, you had you know, sure. research, all of these you know places where there were smart people inventing important technologies, but couldn't necessarily translate that into product that people loved, that made good profit margins, that fueled more product. There's, there, there's something in there about asking the why along the way to get the right product out first. A what, what, absolutely, the why, why, why. So, so for this book, because I wanted to make sure I, so I use the same process that I've used for Nest and all these other things. I want to make sure this book was going to be relevant. I want to make sure it's real and make sure that we, we delivered on the promise. So we wrote the, the, the draft press release. You, you see press releases all the time. What is that one page? What's that one and a half page summary that you know at the end of the project you're going to give to someone like you or whatever and say, this is why this matters, right? So many people wait till the end. As you said, that's the window. You have to do that at the beginning, even before you have all the team, before you have models or you know graphics or whatever it is you're building. You need to understand that you're going to this thing is your script, like just like a movie script. Here's the script. Here's the treatment of what you're going to have at the other side, right? A movie doesn't happen. People don't film a movie and then they go, "Oh, now here's the script and here's how we sell it." They come up with the story early. You have to treat it just the same way but you have to deliver. It's, this is not a fiction. Like too much marketing is fiction. You re watch the marketing and then you use the product and you're like, ah, what? You have so to deliver all along the way. Apply this for me in a product that many of us are familiar with, the iPod, right? Sure. A, a lot of people who are under 30 might not remember that right. there were MP3 players before the iPod. Um, they were mostly either these little tiny things with tiny screens and bad navigation and a little bit of flash memory or these big, bulky paperweights, right, with an actual hard drive in them, also with tiny screens tiny and bad screen. navigation, but right. holding a whole bunch of songs that you couldn't find because the navigation was crappy. Um, so what, what's the wrong way to either not ask why or to you know, assume needs that caused that huge bifurcation and bad MP3 players that you working with Apple were eventually able to. Fix. Sure, yeah, why, why were we able to bring that to, to life? Why, why did it happen? And so at the time, back in 99, 2000, you know, these companies, uh, these mostly Korean companies, because the MP3, somehow MP3 players became popular in Korea. They started just jamming bits together. Like I can get this bit, bit, this bit, boom. And then here's a product. But they were, all they were trying to do is just play MP3s. They weren't trying to give a music experience, right? So they were, I just want to play MP3s. It's kind of like, um, I just want crypto, right? So all these geeks get around it and they go, oh, and they have to work through 25 different steps and no one knows what they're doing, but they feel so good. And I do this new technology. I'm embracing this new technology. When you bring it to a general audience, they don't care about all that geeky stuff. So in the case of the story for why the iPod, everybody loves music. They love to have all their music with them whenever they want it. Before we had mobile data networks, before Spotify and all these other things, streaming services. How do we get the music you love with you at all times? Without the hassles of CDs, without the craziness of MP3 and all the geekiness. How do we bring the promise of digital music to the masses in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a digital bits only form, not in CDs or what have you? So it starts with that and it says, what's out? So that's, that's the audience. Every audience was everybody. Everybody loves music. Everybody loves their music all the time. Then the next piece of the puzzle was how do we deliver it, right? And so how do we make sure it has fast syncing time? How do we make sure it has at least a thousand songs? Because no thing was even close to that. The best you could do is a, you know, a CD with maybe 20 songs on it or a big hard drive. Where, where, where did at least a thousand come from? The thousand was just because the tech, luckily it all worked out that the technology for the mini hard drive, because there was big hard drives, right? This was the first mini hard drive, a two and a half inch hard drive that Toshiba only wanted to put in laptops. And so it was like, oh, it was this size, it was five gigs, and five gigs was a perfect size for a thousand songs. So that just fell in our lap, right? That was like, it could have been 750 songs or whatever, right? depending on the song length. But 
So that was great. So that was a perfect time. Then it needed to have long battery life. As you know, those big ones or the small ones had no battery life. Or they had a really small and they had long battery life, but they only had 20 songs on it. So it's like great. Yeah, it was like one mixtape you got to carry around. Right. And you had to you had to load all the files onto that mixtape and take them off each time. You couldn't just change the tape. And it was slow, USB. And it, 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 before, USB is so fast now. So all of these things, people were putting these things together and showing the promise, but they weren't delivering an experience. It, they were actually, at, they were delivering more pain than they were actually delivering a solution. So it had to spin it all and say, let's use the technology in service of this new experience. How can we make a better experience? Faster transfers, longer battery life, um, pocketable, thousand songs, a great user interface to consume music, as well as a great interface to put music on, which was iTunes. And remember, the iPod was not a success without iTunes and vice versa. Those things came as a, you know, as a combination. And if you didn't have that, so we had to make sure that that was streamlined, right, between those two products. It wasn't just the iPod side. So all of those things came together to then, you know, make the first iPod, which was a great story, but only for Mac users. It actually That's what I wanted to get to because yeah. one of the biggest moments, I think, and it took a while, longer than a moment, was the process that Apple went through of deciding that the purpose of the iPod, the grand purpose beyond, of course, people enjoying music, was not to make the Mac ecosystem more attractive. Because Steve Jobs had been talking about with the launch of Apple retail stores and all this, reaching the other, what was it, 95%. That was the mission. Well, of really, ninety nine percent. Yeah, <laughs> right. The people who didn't, who are on Windows, not Macs. Yeah, the, the retail store was going to show you what a great experience you could have with the Mac as the digital hub and all these other things around it. The iPod was going to show you how great it was to plug into a Mac. But at a certain point, Apple had to decide. Wait a second, this is bigger than the Mac. We're actually going to. A let HP have an iPod, which was oh, weird. But, what a project. <laughs> but in the process, end up with a Windows version of iTunes that then expands our addressable market, right? To yes. everybody, potentially leaving the Mac behind. What was the piece of of why, right, that had to be asked uh, above the product level? Why does this exist for Apple? What what purpose does it serve for Apple? Now that it's a success. How big well, a success can it be? D does it dilute well, the brand? Well, look, Steve was very clear, not over my dead body will I ever ship a iPod for a Windows machine. Just wasn't going to happen. That was at least the first generation and then the second generation because he didn't say, he, he wanted to sell more Macs, right? But the problem is to sell an iPod, you had to buy a Mac. So the, the iPod, which was $249 or $299 or $349, whatever it was, was plus the cost of a $2,000 laptop or something. So, so it was like, it was inaccessible to get people to switch because they're like, I'm on Windows. I have compatibility with Word and all these apps. There was no quick, there was no quick and there was no all kinds of other things at the time. So people are like, I can't do this. It costs too much to have an iPod, you know? And so when we actually found and saw the sales numbers, right? And saw that there was not a Mac conversion really happening for people to move to the Mac. Then the stark reality of the data and the customer voice came out, said, we love the iPod, but we can't spend this kind of money. And so we're not going to move to the Mac just for just for the iPod. So that was one thing was coming in. And then we had to, you know, get the decision, help us with the decision by a third party, Walt Mossberg in that case, to actually tell us that this was we were on track and we were doing the right thing because Steve didn't want to make the decision and say, yes, we need to go to Windows. He wanted somebody else to make the decision for him because he didn't want to be wrong. Huh. Um, it was very interesting dynamics about all of that. And, you know, for background, you were leading the iPod division. So I'm suspecting you wanted this to be as big a success as possible. So you were pro, right? Um, I said, from the time. beginning, from, the, from day one, I said, we're going to, we got to make sure it's working on Windows. He said, over my dead body, never. And so we started a skunk workers project with Music Match he didn't know about that we were starting to work on this thing to get this stuff going. And then he finally started to embrace it when he started seeing the numbers and everything else. But we always had the intention of going there from a team perspective, but it took time for Steve to see the data and understand the audience had to grow tremendously if we were gonna have a success on our hands. Another moment like that, right, was at the launch of the iPhone when sure. he was very much against native apps 
from third parties. It was like right. a- Apple can code directly to the phone. We'll have those native apps, but everybody else, web apps are fine. And then eventually, right. after kind of a developer uproar and, and something else, I don't know, you tell me what else kind of went Customer into- Customer voice, it was corporates. Corporate said, I want to build this app. I want to build this app. I will buy hundreds of thousands of things. I need to build this, build this. So between the developers uproar and then the corporates, and there's one other thing. If you remember, Eric Schmidt was on the board of Apple. And he was licking his chops when he saw web apps. And he was like, this is the right way to go. Go for it, Steve. You got to do web apps and web apps only. Right? And, you know, ultimately... Eric wasn't on the board much longer for obviously conflict of interest reasons. But right. so I think he got to like, oh, they're a little bit too happy and emotional about the web apps. They're screaming that they'll buy a lot of them, these corporates, which Apple really did care about some corporates designs, but not Fortune 500 for the most part. And developers were screaming. And, and then he was like, wait a second, we can't own the mobile phone carrier. So if you also remember... The other decision that we made because he wanted to drive it, Steve did, was that we had the wrong business model for the phone. The business model of the phone at the time was to sell it at full price because he doesn't like discounting, no subsidized. And he wanted to take a percentage of the mobile phone bill. So it was truly a full stack thing. And then the market spoke. The sales weren't as high as they needed to be. The carriers were upset. The users were saying it's too expensive. And then all these developers saying, you know, and people were saying, ah. So we had to rejigger, add the app store, change the business model, add more carriers, subsidize the phone, and re- and go back to square one and the status quo in some cases for a lot of the different things. And then he was like, oh, I can lock in people with apps, right? So, so- I can lock in and make a platform here. And that was the big... That was the big thing since we couldn't get the money from the mobile carriers that we wanted to. Here's the thread that I want to bring through the history to today's builders and creators, the audience that's going to be looking at your your book, um, is the ability that you learned and that Steve Jobs demonstrated to change his mind based on data without losing Mm -hmm. confidence. I think a lot of us, right, our confidence is based on being demonstrably right. Like like we make something and it does well, right? Or we say something's going to happen and then it happens. It's hard for us to admit that what we thought was going to happen isn't going to happen, that we actually have to do something different. And then if we admit that, we get kind of sheepish, like, oh, okay, well, I was wrong about that. So what do you think? How do you as a builder retain your confidence about the underlying idea, even if you're wrong about some of the tactical details? Okay, great question. So first thing, if you have that, you know, you were talking about sheepishness, if you got it wrong. No, you have to embrace it and say, we got it wrong. We learned something. That was great. It's time to move on and adapt to what we've seen because we didn't get it right. So that's that just takes leadership and say, and, and reframing of the error because we only learn by shipping, right? And we only learn by customers giving us feedback. And sometimes you get it wrong. So there's a chapter in the book all about it takes three versions of something to actually get it right. And so we talk all about in the book those key, key things. So I, I, I you know, because I've experienced it, it took three versions of the iPod to get it right, three versions of the iPhone to get it right. Um, so, uh, so those things happen. So you have to deal and reframe it properly. But there's a difference between V1 or the first time you've innovated versus V2 the next iteration, major iteration. V1, and this is another chapter, it's called opinion versus data. When you make a V1, it's mainly, many of the decisions are opinion-based decisions and they can't be data-based decisions. If they're data, then you get consensus and, and you can't get data at the time. This is why you see a lot of companies struggle and have a crisis of confidence because they try to get data for something that doesn't exist so they can't make a V1. They, they're able to fast follow because they can see what happened with somebody else's V1 and then try to innovate off of that. But they don't have the culture to understand opinion versus data decisions and understand that the opinion-based decisions can't be a huge group of people because you get lowest common denominator. It has to stick with one, two, three people. Maybe that's the CEO or founder. Maybe it's not. 
but it's got to be entrusted. That story, the way you see the market, the audience, how you're, the pain, the solve, all of that has to come together and it has to be regarded with the utmost of care because you can very quickly water it down and not have that story be told properly for a V1. When you get to V2, you can see what things, opinions you had that were right and other things that you're wrong. And you say, oh, I've learned from that. And now we're going to solve that. Let's listen to the customer. But you're still going to have opinions because you have to keep doing things that the customers never saw. You know? And so you have to have opinions on new features. But to find that first new lane, a whole, you know, a new you know, wide green field for a new product that never existed before in a space that never existed before. It takes a lot of guts and it takes a, you know what? I might be wrong, but I think I'm right. Let's try it and test it and put all this money and time on the line. Right. And that was the genius that is many of the successful founders today because they, they work really hard to understand the story and, and form and, and, and create a V1 when everybody's laughing at you. Right or saying what? That's crazy. <laughs> Nest was that. You know, my wife was laughing. I mean, are you kidding me? A thermostat? What? Every time we shipped the iPod, you know, the first time we shipped it, laughing at us. Right? You probably remember the laughing, whether that was Microsoft or whomever. Right? They were laughing. At us. I iPhone. How many people? Are, BlackBerry, CrackBerry, laughing. Are you kidding me? There, that's a toy. Nobody in business is going to use it. Nokia, ha ha ha. Whatever. That's when you're on a good track is when your competitors and you're disrupting them with your V1 and they're laughing at you. They ultimately start getting angry and they start suing you uh, or trying <laughs> to block you in some way and get you out of the channel and everything else. You know, iPod, we were sued. iPhone, we were sued. Nest, we were sued, right? Shows and laughed at. So you might be on, the, I think you, if you think you have a tiger by the tail and you have a disruption, if that happens to you, that's a great sign. Yeah. Well, one of the things that frustrates me in some of the historical retellings around some of the projects that you are involved in and, and Steve Jobs in general is people act like he never got anything wrong. Like people thought, oh, Apple's lost his soul. And I was like, nobody remembers mobile me. Nobody remembers iPod hi-fi, right? Nobody remembers these things. It takes the, Mac know, the, cube. the G4 the cube. Mac cube. The G4 cube, there you go. Like it takes guts to bounce back from those things, right? When uh, when the product is based on opinion and your opinions are not borne out by data. So there is no V2, or at least there's no V3. But anyway, I, I do want but if to- you're not, get... if you're not failing, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough and you're not gonna innovate and you're not gonna keep your company fresh. You know, people laugh at Amazon with certain products or whatever they do and they go, oh, they're shutting this down or whatever. It means they're trying. And to me, I give them credit for that because they are trying. And you know what? You are going to fail sometimes. Steve didn't hit bat a grand slam homer every time. He, he might have batted maybe 300. Might have batted 300. Because there were so many other failures. But we got the successes right because we worked through all of those failures to find success. Now, um, I, I got to get into more about you specifically. We, we spent a oh. long time in the toughest problem part. We had to, because I think this problem is broader than one that you alone are tackling. It's, you know, the whole industry, everybody who's trying to innovate. But um, you, you talk about this a bit in the book. I like to start from the beginning, like where you were born, um, no, household, sure. parents, siblings. Uh, sure. Your dad was a Levi salesman. Right. What did you say? You moved like 12 times in 15 years? I went to 12 schools in 15 years. Yeah, we didn't move 12 times. I think we moved like about nine times in those 15 years. Well, okay. Um, so yeah, so I was bouncing all around the US and not to the most glamorous cities uh, you could imagine, but it was, you know, I got to see different cultures all around and all those things. And uh, along the way, you, there was an interaction with your grandfather where you wanted a computer and he said he would put up half of the cost, but you had to come up with the other half. So what did you do? I caddied all summer. So I was a golf caddy. I sat there in Detroit, in, in, in outside, just outside of Detroit. And I would go to this country club and literally it was the same country club that a lot of the people who I went to grades or middle school with um, went to. So I'm caddying for their parents. I'm, you know, doing whatever it was. And I'm just sitting there, you know, we were the lower middle class family, uh, you know, in this higher class neighborhood. And I'm sitting there doing whatever I can to make the money 
to because I really wanted an Apple II. And my grandfather said, I'm going to do it. You just have to get half of it. And so it was just, you know, doubles. I was doing doubles and you know, whatever, <laughs> it took, twice, three times a day, uh, you know, to, to make that money. Why did you want an Apple II? That was really the computer, you know, at in this is 1981, 82, 81. There was no real other computer. The PC wasn't even there yeah, but yet. What, I mean, why did you even want one? Because it was a tool. It just looked cool. I was like, I, I don't know what it is. But my grandfather and I, my grandfather taught me to use tools. I was building stuff, you know, physical stuff, um, birdhouses, repairing lawnmowers, whatever it was with him, repairing houses. And so I saw this tool and I saw people like resonating with it. And, you know, I was also an Atari 2600 guy, right? So you, it was the early days of, I even had a Fairchild system. So I was really into those kinds of things. And I was just like, you can actually program this to make the thing that, you know, I like games at the time. I'm not a gamer now, but I was like, I could program this to make whatever I wanted. It's like, oh my God, it was like freedom. I was like, let me try this thing. Oh, and also the other thing is I took a summer school course and I was using an IBM 370 microcomputer that was distant on a on a paper terminal and I had bubble cards and so it was a summer school course it was fifth grade in 70 in 80 and I was doing bubble cards you know when and pencil and my stack my program was like this so I learned to program before there was before I had a monitor it was all you know text on a printed page horrible for the environment of course um and I got hooked on programming. I was like, oh, I can make these things. So I had that little piece. Then I saw the Apple II going, oh, I don't need, and it had, you know, it had green graphics, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I could do this and I could do it at home. I don't have to just go to this big microcomputer. And I was like, I can have that. And I love doing it. I'm like, and it's not cards. I can text and there's disc. I'm like, oh my God, let's do that. And so it was all of these in, coming together. How far in did you realize that the computer could kind of solve your social challenge of having to move around all the time, that you could <laughs> keep in touch and communicate with people who otherwise, through your physical moving and leaving, you, you would lose. Well, great. So there were BBS's bulletin board systems um, that started to sprout up. So I could put a, a modem card in my Apple II and then and then you could start, you know, it was very, very well before the internet. You could sit there and have a little community. There was this thing called the well was a very, you know, important and influential thing that created the ultimately created the web. And so you could go on these BBSs and can communicate it. The other thing I was able to do is because I had the modem and everything, I could program the computer and we would hack. Back then it was Sprint and MCI. If everybody remembers Sprint and MCI, we could hack the telephone network to get free long distance. And because I was always long distance from the various friends and the other geeks around, and we could only do BBS, we hacked it and it got codes out of MCI and Sprint to then, because it, it was a dollar, a dollar fifty a minute, two dollars a minute. And people don't remember that. Like back in the early 80s, they were like, this is wonderful, right? When the telecommunications became deregulated. And so we couldn't afford it and I couldn't afford to talk to my friends. So we would get these codes. And then I would say to them, whoever I was calling, I was like, if anyone calls from anywhere and they say, who do you know from this city? Tell them you don't know anyone. Make sure no, because they would like, you know, so we were doing all this kind of hacking and trying to stay in touch and uh, through the BBSs and these, these, these hacked long distance calls to, uh, to uh, you know, just stay connected. Now you've got this in your history. It's almost like perfect decade slices. There's a decade <laughs> when you become interested in computers and technology and building things. And, uh, and you start kind of trying to, to innovate and, and build things yourself. Then there's a decade of like failure, frankly. Huge failure. But well, huge I, learning, learning. There's a PhD. huge learning at the yeah. same time, connecting to projects that fascinated you and people who knew people. more than you did, um, but, but couldn't quite get over the finish line of business and product success. And then there's a decade, right? Bookended by um, the, the iPod development and the success of the iPhone and the birth of Next uh, of Nest, where the, the, the whole thing comes together. Talk to me about the middle decade in particular, 
defined mostly by general management, but also um, Phillips, et cetera. What was that like failing again and again with really great people around you? Well, first you, first you realize your heroes are humans also. Okay. So that's really important. You know, the people you work with are humans also, you know, they had great runs and they're really smart, but it's, it takes luck. It takes storytelling, all those things to make something really great. It's not just having great brains who've done stuff in the past, but I, you know, for me, when you raise up and, and back in the day, I was in, I was in Ann Arbor at university of Michigan at the time with my own startup. And I was the biggest fish in the smallest pond. I had my own company, but there was nobody around to talk to. There was no internet, right? So I had to get out there. And so one was just getting getting around these people and, and so I could learn from them. Today, luckily, all kinds of people can learn all day long from anybody they want, like in this kind of fashion or read things on the web, whatever it is. So it's very, very different. And collaborate with people from all around the world. So I had to go there. And so in those that, those, that decade, General Magic was all learning about why, why, why not just what, 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 but it was also about learning timing, market timing. We were building things for each other, for the geeks next that we were sitting next to. We weren't building for the, a customer that was out in the real world who had real world problems and could spend money on only the solutions that solved their problems, not just some cool geeky technology that had no relevance in their life. So General Magic was all about timing and why. Then, uh, and so learn, and I also, it, those were the failures. I learned actually how to do engineering in a much bigger scale and work together in a team and, and architect things, hardware, software, that kind of stuff. Then after that was Philips. And Philips, I, you know, I had a concept and I put a Y around the general magic technology saying, this is for the mobile professional. People who have laptops, which were very bulky. What if you had a pocketable thing that you could do simple email? Because email was starting to catch on. You know, there was, you know, various, uh, what was it, Novell networks and stuff like that were coming into place in the, in the corporation. And so mobile professionals could now take their data and do of some little communications. Those products actually were a, a critical success. People liked it. They were like, oh, my God, you're, we were solving a need. And we delivered the best product at the time for that that segment. But man, we had no idea how to solve and, 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 and for marketing and sales because now, the company, is, right? This is something you get into uh, in the book. And I think it's, it's interesting to pick it apart because it's too easy to say, oh, well, it's wrong to work on something when it's not time for that thing yet. But you point out just as long as you know what stage you're in, if you know that you're working on something that you're passionate about, that, that you think is going to be useful in the future, that's fine because then when the future arrives, you'll be ready. But it seems like it's important to know the difference between something that's fascinating, that you're curious about, that'll be ready one day and something that, you know, needs to be ready in 18 months so that you can build a business on it. Because if you can right. choose one for the other, you're in trouble. Absolutely. And constraints really matter. You know, at General Magic, we went on, it was, I, I showed up in 91 and they were like, oh, we're going to ship in 12 months. Then it was 18 months. Then we got through that. It was like, oh, we're going to take another 18 months. And, it, and so it dragged on and it, the, the nature of the beast kept changing and adding technology and changing things. But the why never was answered. It was always, let's adopt the latest and greatest and we need more because the Mac team, when they made the Mac, they wish they put all of these other things in the Mac when they created the V1. And so they felt bad that they didn't put certain types of things into it. So when they saw the, uh, uh, the, the, this per general magic personal intelligent communicator, it was always like, oh, well, we remember what we didn't do at Mac. We need to do that now. So that we got to add this. We got to add that. And so it became this never ending quest without shipping to get feedback from the customer. So you have to put the constraint that you're going to ship within some window of time so that you can actually drive the team to that, keep them together and motivated, but to get the feedback so that you can understand if you have, a, if you're on the right track or course correct. It was four years. And at the end, the internet had showed up. And that was one of the biggest reasons why the death of General Magic happened because of the whole business model, how it was set up. But we were not in touch with 
that technology because we were like in the clouds and we were taking so much time to get it done. And just as a, as a interesting point, if just as we shipped or just before we, we shipped, there was a guy, Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, right? He was creating eBay under his desk at General Magic. And General Magic goes, what? Auction site? Who cares? That's not General Magic. And he's like, well, can I have this? And, and I'm going to leave. And so he left and created eBay. And he was on the right track at the time. But nobody would leave because he would run around going, it's the internet, it's the internet, it's the internet. And a bunch of us were like, oh, my God, because that's when Amazon was first coming out. We're like, it's the internet. And nobody was listening, right? And it was really, uh, you know, you, you kind of learn, like, you got to have the constraints so you can start to see because technology will change. It's even changing faster than ever now. You also have to not just know your market and your customer, but you have to know that another technology can show up really quick to womp you if you're not paying attention. Right. Now, a great example of this timing thing, I think, is the iPad, um, because the iPad was released after the iPhone, right. but development on it, right, if I'm not mistaken, started before. Um, started before what? Before the iPhone. No. The, 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 the idea of let, let's make a tablet computer with a touch, and it just, it wasn't okay. ready. It didn't work right. And, okay. and the technology, though, was was what helped right solve the problem to, to that create you guys were the iPad, the iPad. Right. So, so what really happened and what really went down was that Steve and Lorene had a dinner. Lorene was saying, "You got to meet this Microsoft guy. You got to meet this Microsoft guy." And I forget who it was, but he came to dinner at Steve's house, and he was going all over about, "Oh, these tablets are so cool." The next year it was Microsoft Pen, I think it was at the time, and oh my God, we're going to have these incredible, you know, uh, stylus driven, you know, computers and all this stuff, touch computers. And it made Steve so upset. He's like, they don't know what they're doing. I'm going to do this. So we decided to go and we bought a company called Fingerworks who was doing multi-touch um, and they didn't have it integrated. So it was this big ping pong like um, multi-touch uh, sensing thing and a, a projector from the ceiling projecting the Mac interface. And you could use a Mac with your hands and what have you to see how this technology would work. And he really wanted to get to that today, what is the iPad, but that tablet like experience with the Mac. But because there were so many changes and the Mac really didn't have any kind of, you know, I guess you say wind at its back, right? To get a whole developer community to make, you know, all kinds of new apps for this thing, what I don't think was going to happen. And so we were able to take that technology and put it into a scaled up video iPod for, you know, and then added the iPod plus phone phone technology into it to create what would become the, the, the first the iPhone and then the platform for the iPhone, which then turned into the iPod touch, which then grew into the iPad. Yes. So it's this, and, you know, all of these crazy things along the way that, and you you stick with your opinion, and sometimes it's just I'm going to show them kind of attitude that got us to where we are, you know, where Apple was at in 2008, 9, 10. Talk to me about Nest and uh, eventually Google and and what sure. ended that uh, decade cycle. Um, it was weird at the time to be making a thermostat, right? Huh. Like yeah. um, th there were webcams, there were some home cams, things like that, but not, they were not all point products. They were all point products for specific like security or surveillance or something. Yeah. yeah. So why did you do that? Need, pain, right? You know, the iPod was, iPod, I was a DJ back in early days and I had to carry all these CDs and I had the pain of carrying CDs. So I wanted to make that. So I was doing that in my startup company before iPod. And then iPhone was, you know, that was the need of, I need to take my computer, internet browsing, email. Uh, I want to take music. And also the existential problem that we had of mobile phones adopting the, the features of the iPod. So that was another pain. Like we want to bring all those things together. We didn't want to lose a business that was finally helping Apple to get a wind at its back. Yeah, we won't talk Nest, about the Motorola 
Yeah, um, Motorola Rocker is right, right. So that was a disaster because Steve was like, oh, we're going to get the mobile phone world to work with our services and our music. Well, that was an utter disaster because it was a full culture clash. Like you wouldn't believe like the headaches. Luckily, I didn't have to work on that program. Jeff Robin did. And he would just be lamenting. And, and complaining all the time. And, you know, even when Steve went on stage with this Motorola rocker, which was supposed to take up to 99 songs from iTunes, you know, so you could buy them on iTunes. It was such a bad product that Steve was embarrassed, but he had to because he was contractually obligated, uh, obligated to get on stage to show it. So, and he was just like, it was, you know, you never saw Steve give a product presentation or demo like that it was just i remember awful. that that was the one where ed zander was uh was also on stage right and it ed was like zander, oh, right. this is awkward so then so go fast forward to nest i had problems with all of these home products all around i was building a home i had home product problems since 2002 going up to tahoe and my thermostat i could either leave it on all the time to keep the house warm so when i showed up and my wife showed up it would be warm on the weekends and then but we would be wasting energy all week or I could be really cold when we went up there and take 24 hours to warm up. So it was this thing and I was hacking products, trying to get the phone to talk to the, to the thermostat to, you know, you know, try to program it remotely and it wouldn't work. So that was a pain that I'd had all the time. And so when I went to go build a house and saw that nobody was innovating the products, still the same products were there, the same companies, there was no, there was no love in these categories that were consuming half of your energy bill each month and you hated them, right? And so that was born of the pain. And it was like, wait a second, you're spending $1,500 a month and this thermostat you hate and that thermostat controls it, you could care less. Well, maybe we can put a lot of love into that. You might pay a lot more, maybe five to 10 times more for that thermostat, but it will be remotely controlled. It will turn away, turn down when you're not there and it will save you money and pay for itself in usually in less than two years. That was a story worth telling. I was, I always cared about green, so I didn't want to have waste. So all of these things came together as like, this has to be done. Who's going to do it? The incumbents needed to be disrupted because they had all the, they had all the, the market, the channels, but they had lost the will to innovate. Right. And anytime they innovated, it was usually by suing somebody and taking their innovation and then bringing it to market, which what happened at Nest, actually, <laughs> they sued us Honeywell. But but that was really as we were solving the solving the pain that I experienced and so many people did. And we just targeted it right on and came with a very emotional message, made it beautiful, made it you know easy to install. And it everybody had oh, many people, almost every homeowner has to have a thermostat. And so people, everybody was, you know, hating them. And we woke up that, that we woke up that emotion and they came a running for the product, which was, you know, we had no idea. It was again, a opinion based decision. Um, enough of us had that same problem. We said, this is a problem we're solving and nobody else is going to do it. And who could actually do it? Who has the balls and has the, um, has the ability to network and the credibility to deliver something like this. And that's why we, we, Matt and I and the team all said, we're the ones who are going to change the traje trajectory of that, that the home appliances market. Now you sold it to Google for, I think 3.2 billion. Um, Google became alphabet. They started doing all kinds of things with devices that um, they didn't do so well with, with their <laughs> device strategy. I think I think you and I had a, a bit of a short debate um, at this is probably the code conference before it became code. It's probably still all things D. And I, I will argue that I was right about this. But, okay, well, well, uh, what was this? It, I said things like Nest, there needs to be some unifying interface to manage the smart home. It's right. like it's, it's one thing to kind of have these one-off apps, but there's getting to be too many. There needs to, and you said, no, there doesn't. I think this is still an unsolved problem, like alarm.com. And there's some people out there who have some interfaces for managing your home. But largely, I think the potential of a lot of the smarts that are already in a lot of homes remains untapped. In a similar way to like Sonos is doing a really great job mm -hmm. of helping people yeah. manage music around the home, just better than having a lot of isolated Bluetooth speakers. Like th there's still a software and interface opportunity for somebody to connect to this. Okay. I agree with you. 
So there's two things. I couldn't say what I really wanted to say, which was you were right at the time because I was representing and trying to get people to buy it. <laughs> okay. So I had to say, this is the best thing. This is the best thermostat. And yes, there's going to be lots of different apps that are going to be specialized for all these other things because I needed to sell, dude. So you were right. And Fair that's enough. what we were building underneath the covers at, at, at Nest. So yes, you were right. But we, and we were already building it. I just couldn't say that because that would be like, you know, this is the Osborne problem. Just wait. Yeah, I don't think I'm a startup. I'm fighting for our lives, right? We didn't have a cash cow of another revenue stream. So I had to say what I had to say to sell. Um, but we did fulfill the promise, which was we made an app that had cameras, alarm systems, smoke detectors, and third-party products all came in just subsequent years afterwards. And we, we built a platform. We even built a technology that now Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Samsung are all embracing, which is called Thread. And it's now, it was called Thread and Weave at the time, but now it's called Thread and Matter. And they're all adopting it to put together this, this, this uh, fine tapestry of these products from third parties everywhere. And they, each company, whether it's Amazon or Google or whatever, can have their own interface to control all that stuff, but they, and it can all work together. So that vision is being realized right now and a lot of the technologies and a lot of things that we did was born out of that, that you're going to start seeing really come together the way you envisioned it and you articulated it is going is coming now and will be over the next two years. Like I'm really excited, even though it took 10 years and we didn't get to deliver on the thread and we promise, but thread matters actually happening. And it's across huge companies actually saying we're going to do this together, which is you know phenomenal because you don't see them working together very much at all. Yeah, it's a, it's a big opportunity. Um, and I'll take a you were right from Tony Fidel, even if there's got to be an asterisk in there. I'm sure I was. Oh, right. okay. but right, you were right, right, dude. You were I was, right. I was right. Okay, thank you. You were right. Um, <laughs> You're usually pretty right, I must say. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm going to have a poster made maybe. Um, now, Death Valley. I, it's what I call a lowest point. And I, I love to ask about this because I think there's a lot of learning um, that that – comes out of how you got through it. But, you know, in your book, you're not shy about talking about a lot of failures, a lot of setbacks, but what was the toughest one, either professionally or just in life, um, that you went through, the lowest point where you thought maybe this, this whole thing, this whole innovation thing, or this whole building thing, maybe I, I just need to give it up? <laughs> give it up? I don't know about giving it up, but that was, I, that's never come into my consciousness. Um, but I think I had to really grow up at General Magic. I was this engineer following the leaders, da, 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 da. I'm doing all this stuff. And I was really not asking the tough questions. I really didn't know what questions to ask. I was asking technical things and, and doing the things there. And then when that, when the stark reality that no one was buying the device. And we had it in our gut or I started to feel it in my gut and it came and I threw away my entire life because everyone's like, this is gonna be, if you remember, it's gonna be the next Microsoft. They're gonna, they're gonna unseat Microsoft. Everybody was, and I was inhaling the exhaust of the media and the people around me to be able to bring that grounding and to, it was a very tough time because I, my whole life was surrounded by it. I had jettisoned because I was working so hard. You know, I didn't talk to my friends, didn't talk to my family very much. It was, it was a cult. It was a, you know, in, in some ways I was in a, in a cult, not that they treated us like that, but I, in my mind, I was, you know, it was self-inflicted. And when that bottom fell out and the reality came and, and you were like, what did I spend four, li four years of my life working on? Why did I do this? I wasted... I didn't waste time. I learned a lot. But why did I let go of all of these other things in my life? Because you really need to have balance. You need to have that outside insight, right? Those outside insights to be able to help you rationalize and understand what it is you're building and make sure the outside world likes what it is you're building or will adopt what you're building. So it Phillips and, and, and it took about two years and three years to really understand how to articulate a why instead of a what, how to lead teams instead of be led, how to, but, how to know opinion ideas versus data ideas or idea driven decisions. Those kinds of things, all I had to learn. And those were very low points because it was like, 
you were a mirror was in your face. You really don't know a lot, Tony. You know, in that Death Valley moment, though, linger with me for a moment or two sure. longer. <laughs> what, I won't have what PTSD. Was, <laughs> <laughs> what was the worst advice you were getting, or the thing that you almost did that would have kept you from getting the benefit that you got out of the mm-hmm. experience? Did you almost go back to school for your master, or you know, go backpacking? around the world instead of getting back to like, was there, I did, was there an I did go backpacking, but okay. Did you almost go backpacking for longer? Did you almost not come back? What was the thing? Okay. So, so at general magic, what happened was I was such in shell shock that I, and there was all, it was just, everything was collapsing. I got in a car and I just started driving with my music on because I love music. And I just sat there and I just drove. And then I would get out and I, I spent um, two days. I spent, you know, and I was off. There was no no real grid back then, but I was really off the grid. And everyone's like, Tony just took off. And he was gone for three weeks at General Magic. And I was like, what happened to him? And it was literally me going, you know, is that, you know, two weeks, like the different Native American tribe. You go off and you learn to grow up. I came back. I didn't really grow up, but I had a different point of view and a different way of looking at things. And I said, I need to change some stuff. I need to come back. And so that was the big moment of like, I love what it is I do, but I can't let my life be driven by it or, or, you know, I have to learn from it and learn how to manage it and do the things that I love to do, but do them in the right way with the right process so that we don't have these kinds of outcomes and go and learn about that. And so that was, you know, kind of that, that transmogrification, that metamorphosis time was going out and doing that for a few weeks, you know, and coming back. And um, and then there was a lot of work after that um, to, to really tear apart what was going on. I, I went for two years, uh, four hours a week to um, I, I was doing reading self-help books and reading all about more psychology because I was a psychology and philosophy minor in college. I was getting back into that and I was learning and I was like, oh my God. And I was like, I was like, let's get inside the human brain. Let's understand how other people think and, 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 and how I think like, like, why am I thinking this way and tearing apart and understanding those things. And I ultimately said, I need an expert to help me. So as I'm just like an athlete goes to a trainer or, you know, and a coach or whatever. So I went to a therapist, you know, I went to a therapist. I was doing yoga to get my mindfulness in, all that other stuff, get physical activity in. And I sat there for four hour sessions, for two four hour sessions each week for two years, tearing this all apart, understanding how people interrelated and, and, and how they related to me or I related to them or I related with myself and just getting into human nature and how the brain kind of works and how different people work so that I could start to really see differently, right? And that was really important. And that was a seminal phase in being able to start to tell the why so that you look through, you get in the shoes of other people and start to really be empathetic and understand everybody's not built like you ever, you, and really trying to understand how to communicate, not in your language, in their language, what resonates with them, right? All of these things matter. So you have to get out of your space and get into their space without losing yourself and being able to bring it back and use those insights to help you do a better job. So this is a major shift in between general magic and Phillips. the iPod. Yeah, and in between Phillips. that yeah. and Phillips, yes. But, I, yeah. but what, I'm, what I'm saying is like Phillips, yes. yes, it didn't all go exactly according to plan, but you were on that upward trajectory where your mindset was right about what you were learning and the confidence that it could eventually be something. It wasn't a devastating experience the way general magic was. So I think for- Yeah, because I didn't have any context. Yeah, it was just like, you know. So to boil it down, what's the core belief you got from that experience of, you know, first you're breaking away um, and you're- walking the earth, driving the earth. No, I do have to come back. But then you're really focusing in on empathy, on psychology, on philosophy. How do I relate uh, to the world? What's the core belief that you got from that Death Valley experience that now informs the way you lead, Mm -hmm. the way you manage, the way you build? Okay. So how, what changed? 
what changed very quickly was I have to stop impressing the engineers around me and designing for the geeks around me and going, oh, these are my heroes or whoever it is. I need to impress them. What our job is as designers, as product developers, or even marketing, whatever it is, our job is to communicate the technology and deliver it in such a way that we bring superpowers to people without them having to be geeky. So even if it's not the geekiest stuff that's going to impress the engineer next to you or whatever it was, it was about bringing superpowers and this stuff that we knew and what we were seeing and the technology we were seeing, bringing it to everyday people, as Steve would say, mere mortals, and making them empowered, empowering them to have superpowers. And they feel this way and they go, oh my God, now I can do more, right? And and that is the fundamental shift and that continued to happen. So one was making products and understanding the why. Then at Philips, it was, well, how do you really sell it so they can understand it? How do you really market it and get it in the right, in the get people in the right mindset so they're available to want to adopt this or at least learn about it, right? So all of those things were all about changing your perspective, seeing through that and making sure the superpowers you are creating for people could get to market and resonate and then maybe drive a community that could then be your, you know, uh, word, of, word of mouth marketing, right? All of that was over that, you know, probably six, seven years from the time of end of General Magic till the start of the iPod. Now, all of that said, I want to end with what's most important mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. going forward. I know um, the climate and sustainability challenges are top of mind for you. So how does all of this fit into that, the, the world that you want to leave for uh, the generations to come? Hmm. So somewhere along the route, especially probably right after the iPhone, the world turned more software than ever. It was all, at, it was all bits, social, mobile networks, fintech, you already have all these, this platform of atoms, whether, you know, with servers and phones and what have you. And ev all these great entrepreneurs and br brilliant brains turned to the bits only thing because it was fast. You could scale it. You could, investors loved it because it was a quick ROI, all this stuff. What's really important now is we have every, oh, many, many atoms on this planet. We have to change. And it's not just atoms, it's atoms plus bits. We need to go into a new mindset to say we need to change the atoms. We're going through industrial revolution 2.0, 4.0, whatever the number is. And we got to change every vehicle on the planet. We got to change on the planet, in the air, in the sea. We have to change the materials we use on the things we, you know, we create. We have to change the way we do farming and, 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 and aquaculture. There are so, uh, how we produce energy. We're seeing that with the terrible tragedy in Ukraine. We need to, we're, we're, all this stuff is getting exposed. Like we were getting in bed with all of these, you, you know, these dictator tyrants and because they had what we needed, well, and it, they'll be okay. We'll manage them. Well, we're now we're seeing the realities of that. So for me, we need to change a mindset of the, the quick money mindset because there's even more money to be had. Think about every vehicle changing. Think and look at where Tesla is today, right? All the energy systems, all the hydrogen economy, what have you. There is so much money to be made when every single market is going to get disrupted because of the climate crisis, and it's going to take atoms plus bits to fix it. There's a few bits only companies, but for the most part, it's going to take that. We need to get into that mindset from both the financial markets, the you know whether that's early stage, late stage entrepreneurs. We have to think about that in our universities and what we're doing, you know, um, and re-embrace that because that's what it's going to take to get us past this existential crisis. And there's the why behind building <laughs> and build all together. Tony Fidel, it's been a lot of fun. Always love chopping it up with you. Thanks for sharing about your book, Build, uh, coming available right now. Buy it wherever you buy books um, and sharing about your life as well. 
Hey, thanks so much, John. Always fun time talking and uh, look forward to another time. And hopefully we'll have even more great stuff to talk about. So absolutely, hopefully it won't be a decade. No, definitely <laughs> not that. <laughs> okay, man.